Thank you for joining us. We are Finding God in Video Games, and in today's episode, we are continuing our Dreams Interrupted series with a look at one of the most surprising video game movie success stories in the history of cinema. Everyone's favorite furry blue hero, Sonic the Hedgehog. Well, there's not really that many video game success stories in the history of cinema, well, first of all. Well, there's not, I don't think any. Really well, there's, there's a handful. There's a handful. But this is, <laughs> here's the thing. If you had told me like five years ago, that Sonic the Hedgehog, you know, the game series from Sega, right. would mutate into becoming not just one, but one top two highest grossing domestic video game movie releases of all time. And they have a third one on the way. I probably would have politely laughed. I would have thanked you for your time. And I would have made an excuse to, you know, go find mall security or something. Mall security. Well, that's killing. assuming that you told me when we were in a mall. Oh. If, if we were in a different public space. Why would I, we be I, in a mall? Well, you know, I, I like malls. But if if we were somewhere else, I probably would have just quietly and nonchalantly gathered my family. And we would have made a mad dash for our vehicle. Because clearly, you are dangerously and completely out of touch with reality if you're suggesting <laughs> such a thing. That, that seems... Like an over. An well, overreaction. it might seem like that, but to be but, fair, whoever is braining that to my attention, you know, they are the one randomly approaching complete strangers and sharing unsolicited opinions about which video games should be movies without I context. I suppose that's so, true. That's true. I am just that's saying true. that if you're going to walk up to someone and say, hey, you know what would make a great video game movie? You should at least, like, I don't know, properly introduce yourself, get to know the other person's name, go hang out at Waffle House or something. Waffle House. You know, like, just something normal. And then... While you are in that position, then you can present your bizarre fan fiction ideas for a Sonic movie in a socially acceptable manner. This doesn't have to be Waffle House. I'm just putting that out there because I'm still hoping someday they decide to sponsor us. This, this or just really give me off. a coupon for a buy one, get one free waffle or something. This I'm really, really went off the rails. Really, it, it did. Well, it did. because I was thinking about Waffle. At any rate, I'm all right, back to Sonic. Waffle back House. to Sonic. Okay, At any okay, rate, okay. after the initial trailer, <laughs> the very first one that they did for the movie, and the overwhelmingly negative fan reaction to that first incarnation of the Sonic movie franchise if someone had told me, you know what would make a great video game movie? Sonic the Hedgehog. I would have been like, I knew it. I knew this whole Sonic movie was a bad idea. He only really works well in animation. He had weird teeth. He had crazy eyes. So fast forward now to present day. Both Sonic movies have smashed box office records. Yes, and honestly, I, would, I probably would now look like the one who was out of touch with reality. And the most interesting part about the unexpected breakout success of these two Sonic movies and this, I guess, Sonic verse that we're in right now, it isn't just that it's been successful from a critical and commercial standpoint. It's because the way it started gave no indication that this would work. Right. The fan response to the first iteration of what has now been affectionately named Ugly Sonic <laughs> was so massively negative that the creators made the incredibly expensive decision to completely throw out their first design of Sonic, all of his animations, and start over from scratch. It, that that was crazy. And, and I don't and even I know did. how much that cost. I'm, I'm sure oh. they'll probably never really say. <laughs> but the thing is, you know, video games, they don't really have a great track record of being adapted into successful cinematic experiences. And if you think back, as much as I love so many games in the Sonic franchise, they're not exactly known for, you know, immersive story and thoughtful dialogue. So I mean, much. Mostly it's just, I will go fast. And so this was, points. yes, and then, and then lose them. <laughs> this was an uphill battle from the very beginning. And when it became clear that fans were incredibly unhappy with everything about this more realistic version of the world's most famous hedgehog, it would have been easy for the studio to just throw in the towel and quit. A lot of time, effort, and money had already been spent, and if they continued to invest into this unproven concept that now appeared to be in, you know, from the damaged goods department, well, I mean, it was a massive risk. Unfortunately for us all, the designers between the first ugly Sonic didn't shut down their dream simply because their very first attempt at braining Sonic to life in the cinema universe was a massive failure. 
Now, over the past few weeks in our Dreams Interrupted series, we've been taking a closer look at our dreams and the importance of aligning them with the Lord's will, trusting in His timing for them to happen, and then moving forward even when our dreams appear to maybe be over. And if you miss those, we definitely encourage you to check those out because we're going to kind of build off the foundation that we laid in those three. But as we move into the fourth in our series, many of us, including myself, found that the hardest part of continuing to chase our dreams can be similar to the same one that was facing the creative minds behind this Sonic movie franchise. What do we do after we have started, you know, ugly? As followers of Christ, how do we continue to chase our God-given dreams when we have really messed up, either privately or publicly? What path remains for those of us who feel we have disqualified ourselves from pursuing the original plans that the Lord had for our lives by failing Him, ourselves, and those who are depending on us. These are challenging questions to unpack, and while we all may have a different type of ugly Sonic in our past, they all share the same things in common. They're embarrassing and painful to look back at. They remind us of, of, of choices that we made that we would make differently if we had a second chance, and despite our best efforts, they aren't going to simply go away. So it's time for some answers, and as much as we would like to, we can't simply pretend that these portions of our lives never existed. And Christ did not submit himself to an excruciatingly painful death on the cross so we could live in some version of, you know, the Christian witness protection program for the rest of our lives. He died so we could live abundantly and allow his redemptive grace to enable us to pursue those God-given dreams, not hide from them. But unfortunately, Hiding seems to be the natural human response to our sinful choices. You see that in the very first recorded sin, Genesis chapter 3, verses 6 through 8. We'll read through those very quickly. So when the woman, this is Eve, saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Now personally, I have always found the idea of the only two humans on the entire planet trying to somehow hide from the eyes of God, mildly humorous. I mean, you know, what did they really think was going to happen here? And them of all people should understand that, like, y you can't no, like they, they probably That's... knew all of the animals by name right now. So, like, right, you're, you're right. the only two human beings on the planet. I mean, did they hope that the Almighty God, who had made everything in creation, was somehow the worst player of hide-and-seek in history? Like... <laughs> but the sad truth is that running and hiding from the Lord and his continuing will for our lives is both the original response to the first sinful decision in human history as well as a continuing theme throughout Scripture. As much as we may try to, none of us can outrun the wages of sin. But also, none of us can run farther than the love of God to reach past our sins and restore his repentant children. And just as importantly, the destiny that we were created to fulfill was designed with the full and complete knowledge of all of our ugly sonic decisions before we ever even made them. Look at Romans chapter 8, verses 28 through 30. This is Paul speaking, and Paul would know a little something about making some ugly sonic decisions. Mm -hmm. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God to those who are the called, according to his purpose, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called, and whom he called, 
these he also justified, and whom he justified, these he also glorified. Here's the truth about my own painful path. In reconciling my sinful past with my desire to serve the Lord, with what remains of the only life on earth that I have to give him. The truth is, I have failed God horribly, Mm -hmm. painfully, knowingly. I have blatantly and flagrantly followed my own sinful impulses and desires. And no matter how hard I tried, I could not outrun the heavy burden that those choices had placed on my ability to fulfill his will for my life after my ugly start. Now, sure, I knew I was forgiven. I felt peace with the redemptive work that Christ had completed for me. And like the prodigal son, I had even allowed the Lord to embrace me and restore me back into his family. But the issue is not about my security and his ability to cleanse my sins. It's about wondering, what do I do now that I have been cleansed? What destiny remains for those like me who made some seriously ugly sonic decisions in our past. Do these dreams still exist for us? Well, let's ask the opinion of a man who called himself the least of all the apostles. Once again, the Apostle Paul. In 1 Corinthians 15, 9-10, Paul says, For I am the least of the apostles, who am not worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. And it reminds me of when in Acts chapter 9, when the Lord is originally speaking to Ananias. And that's the guy that was going to be sent to go and pray for Paul so he could receive his sight back. And this is, Paul was in the middle of a crusade to imprison all of the Christians and potentially put them to death. Stephen had just been martyred, and Paul was going to find more people to contribute to that. He was struck blind by the Lord. He was in the city that he originally was going to persecute, and the Lord comes to Ananias. And Ananias is like, um... So this Paul guy, you want me to pray for him? Like, not against him. I mean, he's blind right now. We could we could do some stuff, Lord. And, and God tells him, this is a direct quote, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. Paul's ugly sonic period was as ugly as anyone's could have been. I mean, right. whoever's listening to this, here's the thing. Have you literally tried to destroy the Christian church, the entire thing? (laughs) Did you try to imprison anyone who stood in your way? Probably not. I think Paul's got us all beat there. No matter what you've done, probably have not gone to that level. I mean, in his defense, he thought he was helping. He did. He he totally thought he was doing (laughs) a good thing. He did. So his ugly sonic days, persecuting the church as Saul of Tarsus, is a notably dark period in his personal history. But the Lord saw beyond his ugly start. He saw the trilogy of missionary trips that Paul was going to take to spread the gospel to the world. He saw all of the books, many of them which make up the New Testament that we have now, that Paul would one day write. The lives that would be changed by the messages that Paul had given us for thousands of years to come. Paul's destiny was never in jeopardy of being canceled by the Lord, simply because he started out ugly. Paul's ugly start was already built into the equation at a time when Paul's sandals were still standing on the wrong side of the faith. And the same is true of the destiny that the Lord has designed for each of us and the God-given dreams of serving him that continue to beat in our heart. While we may still remember that ugly sonic part of us that nearly shipwrecked our lives, we are not defined by that anymore. And even when we feel our enemy cover us and our dreams with those little red dots marking each and every one of our previously unsanctified thoughts and actions, there's a more powerful force than the sins that once dominated us. It's the Lord's decision to forget those sins so that we can carry on 
with his mission. Isaiah chapter 43, verses 18 and 19. This is the Lord speaking, and he says, Do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. And then continuing to verse 25, he says, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. This is the challenge that I have struggled with for years. The one that has kept me from pursuing the dreams that Christ placed on my heart. Look, the, the reality is that my sinful guilt at my previous ugly sonic choices was more powerful than my acceptance of the fullness of the Lord's grace. I was receptive of his forgiveness, but I was still hiding myself in the light he asked me to shine because of the residual guilt I still carried from my ugly and shameful past. And I found the answer to my problem in the very first recorded church sermon from Jesus himself in Luke chapter 4. When out of all the possible Bible selections available to him, he chose this reading from Isaiah 61, that he came to fully free us from the prisons we were trapped in, not simply offer us second-class citizenship into his family. Isaiah 61.1, the very first scripture he ever decided to quote, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. That ugly sonic prison that once contained us has been busted wide open. Not just so that we can be saved, but so that we can run free. The power that those chains once held over us has been broken. But for me, for a long time, I was still choosing to wear those chains like bracelets that only served to remind me of my shame as a previous slave to sin. It is never too late for any of us to run towards the destiny that we were designed for and follow the God-given dreams that have been given to us. Leaving that prison cell is an option we have been given by Christ. But all he did was rip that door off of its hinge. It is still our choice to stop living inside of it. And Jesus didn't do all that work busting open our prison so that we could move into a you know slightly more comfortable cell. He set us free so we could run with speed and confidence to share his message of freedom to others. Ugly Sonic became the impetus for the most successful video game movie franchise in history. And the Apostle Paul moved from the church's most infamous persecutor to the world's most successful preacher. So, if you'll excuse me, in the immortal words of Sonic the Hedgehog, I've got to go fast. <laughs> Not because I'm trying to outrun my past or the weight of the sins that are behind me. It's because I've been set free from a prison that can no longer contain me or the dreams and destiny that the Lord has given me. And to be honest, I have some time to make up because I spent far too long running in the wrong direction. I'm not in denial of who I once was. I'm simply choosing not to continue wearing those old chains that have already been broken by the power of Christ. And there's still a lot of prison cells out there that need to hear this good news, even if it's from a voice as unworthy as mine. So if you'll join me, let's run fast and free. We'll finish with a reading from Romans 11, verses 29 through 31. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For as you were once disobedient to God, yet have now obtained mercy through their disobedience, even so these that have also now been disobedient, that through the mercy shown you, they also may obtain mercy. We truly hope this has encouraged you today, and if you'd like to connect with us or check out some of our other content, such as our articles, videos, daily devotionals, and gaming streams, we can be found on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok.